Thank you very much, Chucky. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and to uh, uh, present uh, some of our um, work. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, anticipating challenges um, related to uh, challenges and opportunities uh, related to uh, resources. And I will use aluminium as a case study to exemplify this in more detail. Um, yeah. Um, it is not possible to talk about secondary materials in, in isolation in the context of a circular economy. I will have an emphasis on secondary resources, but in the context also of systems uh, uh, understanding. So, um, uh, how do I move this? Uh, you, you have it. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that's how uh, our current economy uh, looks like in terms of um, uh, material flows. Um, we have uh, mining taking place, leaving holes in the ground. Then we have industry that is manufacturing different products and they are used. Um, uh, and we, if we talk about the use of materials, it is actually good if we think about cities or built environment, because that's where the majority of the material sits. Of course, we have also electronics and, and, and smaller products that are, can be uh, as well relevant. But in terms of overall mass, it is actually good to think about cities as uh, the main uh, resources. And um, uh, what we would like to achieve with a circular economy is um, to increase the recycling um, or the reuse and at the same time, of course, to reduce the flow from um, virgin material into industry. So this is essentially the um, goal. And if you go now to the next slide. Yeah. So what I would like to talk about is, uh, is a circular economy actually better than the current uh, economy? And if yes, why? Um, and how can we move towards a circular economy? What are the main obstacles that we have to um, uh, overcome? And I will use then aluminium to illustrate this in more detail. I would like to uh, quickly mention uh, the, f the answers already to the first question. Um, uh, it's actually a dumb question in my view. Um, what is better, the current or a circular economy? Um, because it's like comparing apples and pears. What I have on top is essentially uh, a city that is growing or an economy that is growing. Um, and of course, less material is available to industry. If the stock is growing here, this means the input is larger than the output. So, and in this case, we have an equilibrium of the stock, meaning that the overall stock here is not growing. And then we have, of course, a possibility to keep materials in a cycle. This has already been uh, pointed out. So it is uh, comparing apples and pears, is if we ask this. We have to look at the transformation over time if we would like to really understand what makes sense from an ecological perspective. And a second point that I would like to make is that the stocks um, are ultimately more important than the flows. Of course, they always come together. We cannot build up stocks without flows. But what is of interest to us in the end is to having services. It is having quality of the built environment and it is also having high quality of the environment, which is all about stocks. And the flows are just the changes that are necessary to lead to the stocks that we would like to have in both compartments. And then how can we move to a circular economy? And here I would like to um, uh, go into the quality uh, aspects um, that are a little bit particular for aluminium, uh, but we have them also for other uh, materials. And then uh, talk about the, the fact how uh, the transition towards a circular economy affects the entire system. All actors in the entire supply chain are affected. And um, uh, this includes uh, changes in the stocks, in materials, in energy. And also, um, of course, uh, policies need to include uh, the fact that uh, all of the actors in the supply chain need to cooperate towards such a transition. 
Um, and this requires a system perspective. And uh, I have in this uh, view here, uh, again, the supply chain of the material is in gray and um, in blue. And these are usually red, they turn out uh, gray now. We have the emission flows, these are CO2 emissions. These are energy flows in the different uh, sectors. And important to see is that the sectors are linked with each other through material flows and the energy flows are actually not independent from each other. They are also connected through the same processes through the material flows. This means that we have essentially a, a network, a fabric of material and energy flows that is very complex interwoven. And we have to understand the totality of this material energy metabolism, how we call this, in order to really come up with uh, solutions that are meaningful for the overall purposes that we uh, have in societies. So what we can say today is that uh, this uh, socio-economic metabolism shapes the qualities of our lives and it is doing so in two ways. On the one side it is the stocks in use. Uh, I have here transportation, buildings, we have all kinds of uh, stocks in use that provide services to our daily lives. And on the other side, it is also environmental services that we get from the atmosphere or from lithosphere, from forests, from lakes, where we'd like to preserve uh, qualities. This current uh, socio-economic metabolism is not sustainable. And it is uh, not sustainable for two reasons mainly. On the one side, we have uh, still poverty and inequality. This is mainly related to the uh, stocks in use. There are as a large share of the global population that has not sufficient access to basic infrastructures. Um, and uh, services. And on the other side, we have a problem of the stocks in the lithosphere and also in the atmosphere that we are filling up these stocks with uh, CO2 or um, other pollutants and that we are depleting um, the uh, primary uh, resources. So a sustainable development uh, then requires a transformation of this socio-economic metabolism of the entire system. And this means that we need to come from a design of individual products towards a design of entire systems. And this is a big change. Um, we have very good engineers that are, uh, um, have a good understanding of designing individual processes, but all of these processes, they are linked together and uh, they, they make up the totality. And we are still at the very beginning of understanding how these total systems actually work, let alone how to control them in desired directions. So this is the main challenge of a sustainable uh, development. And I think this is also the challenge of a circular economy to understand how to uh, design and guide um, uh, a total uh, system. And I would like to illustrate this now with a case study on aluminium. So this here is, uh, shows the global aluminium cycle. Um, uh, we have the primary production route, um, then we have the semi-manufacturing, manufacturing, and then the use of different products with uh, building and construction and transportation being the main uses. Then we have the waste management and we have uh, recycling processes here and we have also uh, recycling of uh, pre-consumer scrap. If we look in total, we see that uh, the recycling is actually more than half of the total aluminium production. So this is the primary production and here we have the secondary production. So we have, are actually recycling quite a lot. However, if we look more closely, we see that uh, the main recycling is coming from uh, pre-consumer scrap, mainly from the semi-manufacturing, but also from manufacturing. And um, this is essentially an inefficiency. Um, so what does this do? It, is, it, is, uh, it means that we, we need not only a, a secondary production, but for the overall system, we need primary production and then keeping the loop going. And we need, in addition, a secondary production. So it is actually increasing the energy use and the emissions, the fact that we are having this loop here. 
In contrast, the secondary um, uh, uh, post-consumer scrap is effectively reducing the uh, energy use and uh, emissions and is also replacing primary uh, resources. But this is very important to uh, consider the effect that we are not just looking at the secondary production in isolation, but look at the overall system, how to uh, improve it. Um, uh, th the reason why the secondary uh, or the post-consumer scrap is quite low compared to the overall demand for material is mainly due to the fact that the stocks are growing quickly at the moment. So aluminium stocks are, are growing uh, very fast. And uh, this is important to understand uh, for um, uh, uh, reflecting about measures for recycling, but also for energy um, use or uh, greenhouse gas uh, mitigation in the industry. So we have here on the left side historical aluminium stocks in use on a per capita basis for different countries. We see that there are quite large differences. Uh, the Europe is, tends to be a little bit lower, uh, Netherlands is quite high and the US is on the top. We don't see any saturation on per capita stocks uh, yet, probably. Um, so aluminium stocks are still increasing, mainly also due to the fact that we are using more aluminium now in transportation for light weighting, which saves uh, energy and greenhouse gas emissions in another sector. Um, we then um, made scenarios for the global aluminium stock, how it could evolve. We assumed different saturation levels based on what we have observed uh, historically in industrialized countries. And we assume different ways how quick this can be, uh, how they can be reached. And uh, this is now the uh, result show here, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions and the uh, mitigation wedges for the different scenario. So you don't need to understand the details of this. What I would like to point out with this graph is the following. The stocks in use that are different here, uh, they make all the difference. We can employ the same technologies and we have very different results uh, based on the background of the growth of the stocks. So it is really the stocks that uh, the, the development that, that sets the boundary conditions for any energy use, recycling and, and uh, greenhouse gas mitigation options. And the effectiveness of different technologies is also very different depending on whether the stock is growing or whether it is mature or, or even in, uh, declining. So this is very important to consider when planning uh, technologies or implementing also policies for a circular economy or for uh, uh, greenhouse gas mitigation. Now I would like to make one other point and this is the fact that aluminium is used in many different alloys. So there is not just one metal, it is many different alloys. And you see here that we have, um, they uh, include a lot of different alloying elements and they are used in, in very different concentrations. But there are essentially two different um, types of aluminium applications. They are uh, castings um, and they use quite a lot of alloying elements and there is wrought aluminium which tends to use much less alloying elements. And the current uh, recycling system, um, uh, as Jonathan has already pointed out, uh, looks like this, that we have essentially a downcycling system or a cascading use uh, where we have different types of rod and everything is ending up in the casting part of the um, vehicles. Vehicles also include a lot of rod aluminium, increasing amounts of rod, but everything ends up here. And um, what is important to see that this uh, uh, bottom reservoir is formed by these um, uh, castings. And um, uh, with this point, I would like to agree actually um, with Roland, who mentioned before this issue of uh, is it meaningful or not to distinguish open or closed loop. Um, this cascading system makes absolutely sense from an ecological and from an economic point of view. 
Um, we can save alloying elements and we can save uh, money essentially by easily collecting everything and mixing. The problem comes that this is not sustainable. If we continue with the same system, we end up in a situation where we have a surplus of scrap that cannot be uh, recovered, where there is no market for it. So the, the, the issue here is again the dynamics of the stock force the system to change if we want to keep the same thing doing in the future, we have to adapt. And uh, this is a, a very important point, uh, a, a challenge that the aluminium industry is going to face. And uh, what is essentially needed here is to move from a uh, 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 cascading use to a system where alloys are uh, uh, better recycled, so that we can make use of the individual alloys that are uh, employed. Okay, I come to the conclusions. Um, so the development of uh, in-use stocks or of cities, to put it simply, defines boundary conditions for a circular economy. Um, and it does so by determining the material demand on the one side, on the, on the other hand also the potential uh, scrap availability and also the quality, it's quantity and quality. And this shapes then the recycling opportunities um, of the industry, but also technologies needed, technological change, energy use, emission pathways, and also uh, jobs. Um, the second point that I would like to make is that the recycling targets, uh, on the recycling targets, more is not always better. Um, for pre-consumer scrap recycling, we can say this is essentially an inefficiency and we would like to have less scrap. Yeah, we would like to uh, be able to manufacture final products with less scrap. Um, on the side of the post-consumer scrap, um, this effectively saves uh, primary resources and energy. But also here we can think about, uh, wouldn't it be better if the products could serve actually longer? meaning that we have less scrap available for recycling. Um, and so, uh, to put it a very uh, in an extreme sense, uh, the most effective economy would actually be one without recycling at all. It would be just that we have everything we need and uh, we don't need to recover the materials anymore. So this is a little bit provocative maybe and uh, illusory, but it, it helps uh, reflecting on, on where do we actually want to go. Um, and th the most fundamental challenge for the aluminium industry, uh, in my view, um, will be to keep recycling as they do now, also in the future, with the increasing amount of post-consumer scrap that has very uh, is, is a mix of very different alloys and um, to reach still the qualities needed in order to provide the services uh, that are demanded for the consumers. So, and this means that we need actually a, a change in the system on, on all the different parts of the supply chain and, and the collaboration of all actors in this supply chain. Thank you for your attention.